At any given hour, our Angel Veterinary team works tirelessly to provide urgent medical care to pets who are loved like family, like Frankie. Frankie is a Great Dane and he is six months old. Frankie, uh, about a month ago, was out for a pee with me. I had two dogs. Uh, this was essentially our backyard. And Frankie got away from me. I had just gotten home and I was looking for them and saw that they were outside uh, across the street at the train tracks. The commuter rail train had pulled in and um, one dog had gone up to sniff a commuter. He's very well trained and my other dog is a puppy. And I was trying to recall him, trying to get him, and Frankie ran underneath a commuter rail train. And then I heard him screaming, bloody murder, so I ran probably fastest I ever have in my entire life. When I saw Frankie get hit by the train, I heard him squeal, yell, saw him get rolled and dragged for about 20 to 30 feet. So I, I eventually turned away to not have to watch it anymore. I didn't see any way he would live, but when I had turned back around, Frankie had walked up to me with three legs. I had no idea what had happened, even still when I saw him. Um, he was across the tracks from me, just screaming like I need a tourniquet. And I actually had a tourniquet in my car, so I ran and grabbed it. I'm a Boston firefighter. Having worked in Jamaica Plain for years, we know Angel is the place to come for trauma care. I called Angel from the car on our way in as Mike was driving. So we like pull right up to the front. They're already outside waiting for us um, with a stretcher. A lot of dogs here get hit by cars being in the city, but getting hit by a train is definitely an exceptional case. It was clear when Frankie came in, he had lost a lot of blood. They have started a blood transfusion um, and basically stabilized him enough where I could come in to fix the problem. I was kind of an emotional wreck, but trying not to be upset because Mike was also an emotional wreck. We understand how nerve-wracking it is to have a pet in the hospital, how scary it can be waiting for those phone calls from the doctors. While we do send photos and, and try to support our clients in that way, um, we're also here just to provide status updates. Angel was so amazing in calling us every step of the way, um, letting us know what was going on with Frankie. The fact that they just stabilized him, they called us right away, and that was the biggest relief ever, so we felt good hearing that. The next morning, I walked in and immediately went to his cage to see how he was doing, and he popped up and was greeting me, wagging his tail, looking for kisses, so it's amazing seeing Frankie do as well as he did. He's the same lovable, caring, goofy dog. The day Frankie got hit, uh, I didn't think he was gonna make it. I didn't think he would live and survive that injury. I didn't know that they could save an animal in that bad of situation, and an angel did. In any given examination room, the angel staff is dedicated to the kindness and care of animals, all animals. We all acknowledge that our pets are like family. One of the reasons we strive for human level care is that I couldn't look an owner in the eye and give them anything but the best because I know that our pets deserve to have the exact same treatment that we would give ourselves. At Angel, we do not compromise on any equipment. They get human-grade anesthesia machines. We have the ability to do radiation therapy using the exact same linear accelerator that you would get if you had a brain tumor. So these animals are getting a level of care that is equivalent to human-grade care. So it's a real privilege to be able to deliver that, and not only that, but to actually see it make a difference in the lifespans of these animals. It might surprise you to know the number of species that we see here at Angel. Of course we see cats and dogs, but we also see seagulls and hedgehogs. Horses, pigs, llamas, alpacas, cows, goats, chickens. Gerbils, hamsters, mice, sugar gliders. Everything you can imagine that's out there that someone may um, own or acquire and, and have in their care, we'll probably see through our doors. 
the 17 years that I've been a veterinarian, I've watched the lifespans of our dog and cat pets grow um, from you know 10 years for a large dog to 15, 16 years. Cats, it's not uncommon now to see a cat who makes it to 21 years old when you know 15 years ago, 12 was considered a good run. Today, we are, we are doing things that we never dreamed of being able to do 25 years ago. We have amazing ultrasounds for cardiology. We place stents in tracheas and urethras and everything from basic general care to very, very highly specialized veterinary care that I think is bringing us sort of close to human medicine. We as veterinarians often look to human medicine for help in determining best treatment plans and what's working in humans because they can do the studies of thousands and thousands of patients where we cannot. We work with a lot of MDs from the human hospitals and they are mesmerized by what we are doing for these patients. Provided it is not cost prohibitive, we can really um, continue opening up the doors to more modalities and more diagnoses and advanced drug therapy to treat our patients that we otherwise never thought we would be able to in, in years past. It's, it's an amazing feeling to tell an owner that you can save their pet when they didn't think it was possible. And to see that first tail wag when an owner comes to visit their pet after that surgery, that tail wag that says, you're my person and um, we went through this together. At any given moment, our relocation teams welcome new animals by the van load, truck load, and quite often by the plane load. Our relocation program uh, is centered around helping animals enter into Massachusetts through Northeast Animal Shelter. And each year we help between three to 4,000 animals. Whenever a shelter system is overcrowded, that individual shelter has to make some tough decisions. Sometimes that's euthanasia, um, just to be able to control the populations. In other times, it just means that the shelters may be overcrowded to the point where they are full. And as a result, people may make more desperate decisions like abandoning animals or keeping them in an unfit situation. The Northeast Animal Shelter uh, became affiliated with MSPCA earlier this year, uh, so we now work together and work as one of their adoption centers, um, and it was a really great partnership. The two organizations have very complementary strengths, so while the MSPCA has mastered working locally, we've uh, mastered working nationally. Primarily um, Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, Kentucky. We bring in about 4,000 animals a year. Fortunately, here in New England, we have plenty of adopters and the demand for adoption is really high, so we get to help shelters across the country um, alleviate some space in their facilities and bring them here, find them homes, and that allows them to take in more animals locally. My name's Jenna. I'm here with Northeast Animal Shelter and all the MSPCA locations. We're all eagerly awaiting the arrival of a transport of 100 kittens coming from Louisiana. Once the planes arrive, we're going to be eager to get them loaded up and head back to the Cape location of MSPCA. No matter how long you do transport, it never gets old. Seeing animals come in from places where they otherwise wouldn't have had an opportunity to find a home, it's just so rewarding. So seeing the plane doors open and hearing the kittens meow and they're excited, we're excited. It's going to be a great next couple days at both organizations. Here in Cape Cod, we took in over 30 cats and kittens from a partner in Louisiana. So we had all their rooms set up and then they will stay with us until their quarantine is over. And then after that, they will look for their new adoptive homes and we'll do matchmaking for them. Today, we took in 19 dogs and puppies from Charleston Animal Society in South Carolina. It's a blessing that you guys up here can take them in, have the ability to find homes for them and you have the, the vacancy. This is good, this, this needs to continue. 
When dogs and cats arrive at Northeast Animal Shelter on one of our transport vans, um, they're immediately unloaded and brought into our isolation facility. From there, they get a health check with our veterinary team and we address any kind of medical concerns that we may have. They get vaccinated, spayed and neutered if they need to be. And from there, they go on to work with our behavior team. We put together a synopsis of what we think would be a great family for them, and then we make them available for adoption. Well, I think the challenge we've always had at the MSPCA is that we are open admission for intakes, which means we never refuse animals from coming in because of their age, breed, size, or their needs. And sometimes they have significant behavior or medical needs. We want to make sure that we're able to support as many animals as possible and get them to a point of being healthy enough and behaviorally sound enough to be able to find a new home. Sometimes that takes an incredible amount of time and resources from our staff and volunteers to get that animal to a place where they can successfully join a new family. It's hard not to get attached to the animals that we're helping. They're going through an incredible transition and I think we're always there to provide them the companionship love and comfort that they need. When you see new families leaving the adoption center with a dog on the end of the leash or a cat in a carrier and they're going home tonight and that animal is going to sleep well surrounded by the family that has just been created and that we've had a hand in that, that is inspiring to me and I get so excited to play even a small role in making those new families happen. It really, it makes my day. The MSPCA at Nevins Farm is an incredibly unique facility that provides care for the smallest hamsters to the largest horses and everything in between. Uh, in addition to that, we have so many programs uh, and opportunities that support people in our community. There's really no other place like that in this region. It makes it a truly special and unique place. In any given town, our law enforcement department is investigating animal cruelty and neglect, and when necessary, removing animals from incredibly dangerous situations. The animals that come to Nevin's farm for care, they're often coming to us uh, either through families who, for whatever reason, can't keep them anymore. They also come to us through law enforcement cases. These are animals that sometimes have experienced the worst that humankind can offer to an animal. And our law enforcement steps in and brings them to us in the hopes that we can help rehabilitate them, that we can restore their dignity and bring them back to a point where you can see the light in their eyes and you can help them on their journey to a new life. The MSPCA Law Enforcement Department gets um, calls, so you can get a call from a mailman. It can be a relative or a visiting nurse. Somebody went somewhere and saw something that made them uncomfortable. That's why it's so important for people to call us. On July 26th, Officer Wyand alerted us that there was two cows that were in bad shape. They were thin, their shelter was not up to snuff, and they were in a small space where they were not able to graze. She sent me some photos, and just looking at the photos, you could tell that these animals were in danger, and they needed immediate assistance. So our team at Nevin's Farm um, got prepared, got loaded up for trucks to get down there, and uh, were able to get the cows safely loaded onto the vehicles and transported up to Nevin's Farm.
What we use to decide how undernourished these cows were is a body score. So this is a system that we use out of ranking one to nine. The scores near one are very skinny. Uh, the scores up towards nine are overweight. JJ was a two on the scale, so you could see rib bones, hip bones, um, divots in his back, so he was very undernourished. Betsy was a three, so she was a little bit heavier than JJ, but you could still see a lot of her bones, the ribs and the hips. And JJ, in fact, was stunted in his growth. He should be much taller and larger than he is, but he still looks like a fairly young calf, even though he is a year old. So we started a refeeding program, just slowly bringing them up with grain, uh, free range of grass so they could graze and unlimited hay. In a, just a few weeks, we were able to see that they're improving quickly. They're gaining weight, and we know that in a few short weeks to months, we'll be able to get these cows right back to where they need to be. No matter how many times I've uh, helped taking in animals from a law enforcement situation, you can just see the desperation in their eyes and you can just know that they need your help. And what's amazing is that once they enter our care, and they receive the love and attention from our staff and volunteers, you can see those eyes soften. And you can just see that they are there and ready to go to the next chapter. And that next chapter is a new loving home where they'll never have to worry about being neglected or someone being cruel to them again. any given pet owner's home, a dog or cat is sneakily helping themselves to something they probably shouldn't. As you can imagine, dogs and cats can eat a crazy amount of things. We've removed child's toys, an enormous ball of wire, rubber duckies, baby wipes, feminine products. <laughs> so I've seen different sizes of balls, butter knives, steak knives. A big pile of leaves and dirt, car keys, cell phones, an entire L.L. Bean uh, leather boot, nightgowns, uh, shirts. I had a dog that swallowed the grandmother's um, long underwear that I had to take out. Um, it's kind of gross. I don't know if I should tell you the whole story. <laughs> we have one cat that's been here probably eight times for eating earplugs. There was a dog that came in years ago that ate, I think, 37 pacifiers. Shish kebabs are a big one. An entire bag of peanuts. Shells, wrapper, everything. A dog came in with a foreign body in the stomach that was cloth, we thought it was cloth. And we scoped the dog and it was underwear that did not belong to the wife. So this dog got a hold of some undies that weren't the wife's undies. So the lady's like, honey, whose undie, whose undies are those? Get it? <laughs> you can't film that. <laughs> no matter what they eat, and um, we can always remove it. And they usually have a happy ending and they go home and finish eating whatever they were eating before. For any given injustice, our advocacy team is fighting to create new and better laws to protect pets and wildlife all across the Commonwealth. Our adoption centers welcome animals of every species, age, and breed, and work hard to remove barriers that stand between them and a loving home. The MSPCA stands for the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And the advocacy department really works on that prevention in our name. We work to pass laws and policies to really stop animal cruelty before it starts. I cover the Boston area. It's one of my busiest areas. There is a large number of dogs that tend to be um, deemed as the most aggressive dogs and there's this image that goes along with using them as protection or a, a mean of defense and I think what happens is a lot of people 
make them into something that they don't start off being. In 2010 through 2012, there was a, a lot of um, issues that were happening around pit bulls. There were well-publicized bites or attacks. As a result, communities started to make legislation to prevent people from being able to own pit bulls or make it harder for them to own pit bulls. Sometimes communities just look for a quick solution, um, but we know that just banning a certain breed of dog doesn't work and that solutions to a problem take more time and work in community outreach. Um, a lot of that we have done to really make communities safe and protect people from dog bites from all breeds of dogs instead of focusing on just how a dog looks. We want to make sure that no matter what the breed is, that they have an equal opportunity to love, care, and adoptive homes and that they're protected within the communities. Uh, we have dealt with local and state related issues when it comes to pit bull bans and our advocacy department led the charge in making sure that pit bulls were protected and in 2012 helped to pass legislation that banned breed specific legislation. So there would be no opportunity for Massachusetts at this point to ban pit bulls from a community or from the state. They are protected just like any other species and that's the way it should be. For any given need, our volunteers bring food, medical care, supplies, and counseling to underserved neighborhoods. So there are a lot of people who believe that if you can't afford a pet that you shouldn't have one. We do not believe that. They enrich our lives, they make us healthier, they make us happier, and we don't believe that that's something that should only be accessible to people who have a lot of money. There are people who live in our community who have to make really hard decisions every day, whether that's between feeding themselves or feeding their pets or keeping their electricity on versus paying a surgery bill for a pet. And so our community outreach program is really there to make sure that people have pet food and make sure that if they want to get their pet spayed or neutered, that's not going to prevent them from keeping their lights on. It's a really grassroots program. We started just by being in the neighborhoods, talking to people either on the street or in their home and getting to know them that way. Um, and as we met people and people gained excitement and enthusiasm about our program, people started referring their friends and family to us. They work hard, they're kind, they're loving, and they just need a little bit of support. We've had a ton of success with our food distribution program. It's something we started uh, in March of 2020 and between the pop-up pantries that we've done at all three of our locations as well as the food pantries that we've been working with, we've distributed almost 2.5 million meals since the beginning of the pandemic. To be able to provide those resources to them has really changed a lot of lives, both of people and of pets. No matter who you are or how much money you make, you deserve to have the love of an animal in your home. On any given case, Angel Vets and support staff push every resource to its limits for their patients. And in the process, they push themselves to the limit as well. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Being a veterinarian can be one of the hardest jobs, um, at least that I've ever done. In a typical year, we see 86,000 cases. With the pandemic, we have increased our caseload to 97,000 cases this past year. I mean, we've had the busiest year of our careers, and um, just our caseload alone keeps us working till 10, 11 o'clock at night writing reports, and training interns training residents to that where we really have to stop what we're doing and, and, and listen and teach. It is tremendously stressful and has created a lot of, I would say, compassion fatigue in the staff. And the pandemic has changed people too. You know, people have less patience, clients, and it's harder for them because they're worried about things and they have other stresses on their lives too. People are super connected to their animal, like that's their kid in some instances. So. When you take your sick animal to the vet, everyone's stressed out. They want to make sure their animal's okay and they kind of don't have any power over anything. So I think a lot of people kind of take it out on the vet when they, they can't figure out the issue. 
So vets kind of take that personally too. So they'll take all of that feeling of like, I can't fix an animal and they kind of take it home with them sometimes. The veterinarians have the highest suicide rate of all professions. You know, everyone thinks of their local vet as the nice cheery doctor that doesn't seem to have a bad day. But in reality, many veterinarians struggle with mental health due to compassion fatigue and burnout. We can't do things as quickly as we want to do it. People have to wait, animals have to wait, we have to wait, and it's heartbreaking. To think that we actually have to turn people away sometimes now, it's, it's like unspeakable. It just hurts so much. You know, you don't want to, you don't, you know, it adds so much stress to you that you know, you almost want to see him. It's, it's easier to say, yes, just come in, but we don't have the nursing staff. We don't have the ability. We can't take care of him. It kills. But we're lucky because, you know, we work in a great place. We share the ups and we share the pain um, and we talk and we help each other out. They are um, really taking care of us throughout the day to make sure we're getting fed, to make sure we're getting, you know, socialized. We honor the technicians, we honor different departments. Those things I think are very important for morale around here and, and um, I think are very helpful. I have some of the best and kindest colleagues that I can lean on um, and they'll stop what they're doing to help. And that is what makes practicing complex medicine on hundreds and hundreds of animals doable and even fun here at Angel. At any given time, we're in the classroom, on medical rounds, and in the trenches, training and inspiring the next generation of veterinarians and technicians. Angel Animal Medical Center is the oldest training facility in the United States for a new veterinarian. We're accepting 17 or 19 interns every year. And they spend a year with us uh, and they work really hard. And these are people that are really good veterinarians. They're coming out of vet school, they're at the top of their class. And the training program is incredibly intense and they work really, really hard. And uh, they become part of our family. It's one of the most difficult programs in the country, just as far as number of emergencies that they see, uh, the stress load, the case load. It's, it's difficult, but they learn a lot. I get to see veterinarians who do procedures for the first time, and I know that when they do them for the rest of their career, they'll do them the way that I taught them. And I know they'll think of their time at Angel, and there are thousands of veterinarians out there who have been touched by the ANGEL program. And we often get emails from past interns who want to ask just one more question. Once they leave the program here at ANGEL, they have a lot of options. Usually they get their first choice in terms of matching with a residency or they get their first choice in terms of a job. The human pet bond is, um, I think, one of the most reverent uh, experiences that we can have in our lives because it teaches us what unconditional love looks like. They are the fur you can cry into when you're having a bad day. You can tell them about any problem in your life and they're never going to tell you you're wrong. You can be your least best self and when you walk through that door, your pet is there to greet you as if it was you know, the best thing that ever happened to them that day, because probably it was because they love us that much. And I think all of us can learn from our pets about how good it feels to be loved without judgment. Animals are critical to everyone's well-being. They provide us companionship and comfort when we're uh, struggling with things. During this pandemic especially, we've all come to recognize just how important animals are in our lives. As a whole nation, we went through a challenging situation all together and that people were desperate to make sure that they had that companionship for animals. I have a horse at home that is a rescue himself, and I don't think I could have ever bonded with an animal more fully than I bonded with him. He relied on me to get him through scary situations. That built up 
us working towards trust between the two of us and we got to the point where now he will follow me everywhere and that relationship that we have now is one of the best things I've ever experienced. I know with my dogs, Glenn and Murray, it is the most unconditional love that you could probably ever find. Um, there's nothing like coming home and having a wagging tail and happy to see you even if it, you were gone for 10 minutes. And it's a really special, unique bond that I really don't think you can find anywhere else. I have a yellow lab named Sailor who's eight, who's the love of my life. And I understand what my clients feel uh, for their dogs and how, how desperate they are to treat them and prevent suffering and, and you know, go to the, the end of the earth to take care of these animals. For me, in all the years that I've been doing this, and some of the conditions that I see animals in, and the pain or suffering that they've gone through, they come up to you and their tail is wagging, and they lick your face. They're happy to see you. It's unconditional love, they forgive. I want to be a part of delivering that type of relationship to other people who, who may not have ever experienced that in their life. From deep inside the four walls of the MSPCA to as far into the surrounding communities as we can reach, from the floor of the State House to the porches of neighborhood homes, from saving lives to preserving families, from tending to the next emergency to mentoring the next generation of medical superstars, another given at the MSPCA is that everyone here gives everything they have to deliver on the promise of bringing kindness and care to animals. On behalf of our entire staff, sponsors, and production team, and most importantly, the thousands of animals whose lives are healthier, happier, and safer because of the MSPCA Angel, thank you for your support. I hope you enjoyed the show.